I've often said that the sole cause of man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quietly in his room. Self-adjustment. So, in a measure, you have found yourself. Have retreated behind all that flowing appearance, that busy, unstable consciousness, with its moods and obsessions, its feverish alternations of interest and apathy, its conflicts and irrational impulses, which even the psychologists mistake for you. Thanks to this recollective act, you have discovered in your inmost sanctuary a being not wholly practical, who refuses to be satisfied by your busy life of correspondences with the world of normal men, and hungers for communion with a spiritual universe. And this thing, so foreign to your surface consciousness, yet familiar to it and continuous with it, you recognize as the true self whose existence you always took for granted, but whom you have only known hitherto in its scattered manifestations. That art thou. This climb up the mountain of self-knowledge, said the Victorine mystics, is the necessary prelude to all illumination. Only at its summit do we discover, as Dante did, the beginning of the pathway to reality. It is a lonely and an arduous excursion, a sufficient test of courage and sincerity, for most men prefer to dwell in comfortable ignorance upon the lower slopes, and there to make of their more obvious characteristics a drapery which shall veil the naked truth. True and complete self-knowledge, indeed, is the privilege of the strongest alone. Few can bear to contemplate themselves face to face, for the vision is strange and terrible, and brings awe and contrition in its wake. The life of the seer is changed by it forever. He is converted in the deepest and most drastic sense, he is forced to take up a new attitude towards himself and all other things. Likely enough, if you really knew yourself, saw your own dim character, perpetually at the mercy of its environment, your true motives, stripped for inspection and measured against eternal values, your unacknowledged self-indulgences, your irrational loves and hates, you would be compelled to remodel your whole existence and become, for the first time, a practical man. But you have done what you can in this direction. Have at last discovered your own deeper being, your eternal spark, the agent of all your contacts with reality. You have often read about it. Now you have met it. Know for a fact that it is there. What next? What changes? What readjustments will this self-revelation involve for you? You will have noticed, as with practice, your familiarity with the state of recollection has increased, that the kind of consciousness which it brings with it, the sort of attitude which it demands of you, conflicts sharply with the consciousness and the attitude which you have found so appropriate to your ordinary life in the past. They make this old attitude appear childish, unworthy, and last, absurd. By this first deliberate effort to attend to reality, you are at once brought face to face with that dreadful revelation of disharmony, unrealness, and interior muddle, which the blunt moralists call conviction of sin. Never again need those moralists point out to you the inherent silliness of your earnest pursuit of impermanent things, your solemn concentration upon the game of getting on. Nonetheless, this attitude persists. Again and again you swing back to it. Something more than realization is needed if you are to adjust yourself to your new vision of the world. This game which you have played so long has formed and conditioned you, developing certain qualities and perceptions, leaving the rest in abeyance, so that now, suddenly asked to play another, which demands fresh movements, alertness of a different sort, your mental muscles are intractable, your attention refuses to respond. Nothing less will serve you here than that drastic remodeling of character which the mystery 
mystics call negation, the second stage in the training of the human consciousness for participation in reality. It is not merely that your intellect has assimilated, united with a superficial and unreal view of the world. Far worse, your will, your desire, the sum total of your energy, has been turned the wrong way, harnessed to the wrong machine. You have become accustomed to the idea that you want, or ought to want, certain valueless things, certain specific positions. For years your treasure has been in the stock exchange, or the house of commons, or the salon, or the reviews that really count, if they still exist, or the drawing rooms of Mayfair, and thither your heart perpetually tends to stray. Habit has you in its chains. You are not free. The awakening then of your deeper self, which knows not habit and desires, nothing but free correspondence with the real, awakens you at once to the fact of a disharmony between the simple but inexorable longings and instincts of the buried spirit, now beginning to assert themselves in your hours of meditation, pushing out, as it were, towards the light, and the various changeable but insistent longings and instincts of the surface self. Between these two, no peace is possible. They conflict at every turn. It becomes apparent to you that the declaration of Plotinus, accepted or repeated by all the mystics, concerning a higher and a lower life, and the cleavage that exists between them, has a certain justification, even in the experience of the ordinary man. That great thinker and ecstatic said that all human personality was thus twofold, thus capable of correspondence with two orders of existence. The higher life was always tending towards union with reality, towards the gathering of itself up into the one. The lower life, framed for correspondence with the outward world of multiplicity, was always tending to fall downwards and fritter the powers of the self among external things. This is but a restatement in terms of practical existence of the fact which recollection brought home to us, that the human self is transitional, neither angel nor animal, capable of living either towards eternity or time. But it's one thing to frame beautiful theories on these subjects, another when the unresolved dualism of your own personality, and though you may not give it this high-sounding name, becomes the main fact of consciousness, perpetually reasserts itself as a vital problem, and refuses to take academic rank. This state of things means the acute discomfort which ensues on being pulled two ways at once, the uneasy swaying of attention between two incompatible ideals, the alternating conviction that there is something wrong, perverse, poisonous, about life as you have always lived it, and something hopelessly ethereal about the life which your innermost inhabitant wants to live. These disagreeable sensations grow stronger and stronger. First one, then the other asserts itself. You fluctuate miserably between their attractions and their claims, and will have no peace until these claims have been met and the apparent opposition between them resolved. You are sure now that there is another, more durable and more reasonable life possible to the human consciousness than that on which it usually spends itself. But it is also clear to you that you must yourself be something more, or other, than you are now, if you are to achieve this life, dwell in it, and breathe its air. You have had, in your brief spells of recollection, a first quick vision of that plane of being which Augustine called the land of peace, the beauty old and new. You know forevermore that it exists, that the real thing within yourself belongs to it, might live in it, is being all the time invited and enticed to it. You begin, in fact, to feel and know in every fiber of your being the mystical need of union with reality, and 
to realize that the natural scene which you have accepted so trustfully cannot provide the correspondences towards which you are stretching out. Nevertheless, it is to correspondences with this natural order that you have given for many years your full attention, your desire, your will. The surface self, left for so long in undisputed possession of the conscious field, has grown strong and cemented itself like a limit to the rock of the obvious, gladly exchanging freedom for apparent security and building up from a selection amongst the more common elements offered it by the rich stream of life, a defensive shell of fixed ideas. It is useless to speak kindly to the limit. You must detach it by main force. That old, comfortable, clinging life, protected by its hard shell from the living waters of the sea, must now come to an end. A conflict of some kind, a severance of old habits, old notions, old prejudices, is here inevitable for you. And a decision as to the form which the new adjustments must take. Now, although in a general way, we may regard the practical man's attitude towards existence as limpid-like adherence to the unreal, yet from another point of view, fixity of purpose and desire is the last thing we can attribute to him. His mind is full of little whirlpools, twists and currents, conflicting systems, incompatible desires. One after another, he centers himself on ambition, love, duty, friendship, social convention, politics, religion, self-interest in one of its myriad forms, making of each a core around which whole sections of his life are arranged. One after another, these things either fail him or enslave him. Sometimes they become obsessions, distorting his judgment, narrowing his outlook, coloring his whole existence. Sometimes they develop inconsistent characters which involve him in public difficulties, private compromises, and self-deceptions of every kind. They split his attention, fritter his powers. This state of affairs, which usually passes for an active life, begins to take on a different complexion when looked at with the simple eye of meditation. Then we observe that the plain man's world is in a muddle, just because he has tried to arrange its major interests round himself as round a center, and he is neither strong enough nor clever enough for the job. He has made a wretched little whirlpool in the mighty river of becoming, interrupting, as he imagines, in his own interest, its even flow. And within that whirlpool are numerous petty complexes and countercurrents, amongst which his will and attention fly to and fro in a continual state of unrest. The man who makes the success of his life in any department is he who has chosen one from amongst these claims and interests and devoted to it his energetic powers of heart and will, unifying himself about it and from within it resisting all counterclaims. He has one objective, one center, has killed out the lesser ones and simplified himself. Thank you.